extend uh, my welcome to that of Matt. It's wonderful to have you join with us uh, this morning for our Good Friday service, particularly if you're new or visiting with us today. Um, I wonder whether you ever caught the TV show called Undercover Boss. Uh, It didn't really last all that long. I think there was only a couple of series. It was kind of one of those blink and you miss it kind of ones. I think I only watched an episode or two, but, but the concept, the idea of the show really interested me. Because what they did was they got some high-level executives uh, or the owners of corporations to go undercover as an entry-level employee in their company. They changed their appearance and they took on a made-up name. Uh, They got a fictional backstory. Uh, They explained the camera crew following them around uh, that they were part of some sort of documentary uh, following the challenges facing people who were entry-level workers in this particular industry or the other. And these are high-level executives, these owners would spend about a week undercover working in different areas of the company, uh, doing different jobs. And of course, what ends up happening is that they spend time getting to know the people who work in the company, learning about the occupational challenges, learning about the personal challenges that they face. Uh, They got people like uh, the CEO of Domino's Pizza. Um, They had uh, Janine Ellis of Boost Juice fame, Uh, the CEO of Ella Bachet. Uh, One of the undercover bosses even managed to get themselves sacked (laughs) while they were working. Part of what made the show so appealing, I think, is that it's so rare for bosses to come down to the level of their employees. Generally, the higher up the ladder you go, the less you have to do with those down the bottom. You've worked hard to get there. Uh, Enjoy the benefits of your success. You don't need to trouble yourself with the personal problems facing the plebs. Which is what makes the message of the gospel captured so well in this small section of the Bible that we're looking at today so extraordinary. The reason why the Christian church continues to celebrate and esteem this day, Good Friday, still to this day in 2021, is because of the remarkable events surrounding the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. Who Jesus is and what he's done. It's something that Undercover Boss only hints at in the smallest of ways. So what we're going to do for just the next 15 minutes or so is work our way through these sentences from this part of the Bible. It's from a letter called Philippians because it was written to a group of Christian believers in the Greek city of Philippi. And we'll just pick up on three key phrases. Very nature God, verse 6. Very nature servant, verse 7 and death on a cross, verse 8. I'd love you to have the passage open in front of you. It's Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. So firstly, let's have a think about this phrase, very nature God. Have a look with me from verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God... Now, I realise that that might not be your particular view of Jesus this morning, and it probably isn't the view held by others in your family or friends, uh, those at work or at school or uni. But from very early on, the witness and testimony of those who followed Jesus was that he was God. God with skin on, God come in the flesh, the God-man. The four biographies that we have of Jesus in the Bible, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they are chock-a-block full of Jesus saying and doing things that only God could say or do. Let me just give you a few examples. Uh, He heals sick people. He makes blind people see and deaf people hear. He drives out evil spirits. He brings dead people back to life. He calms storms. He walks on water. He turns water into wine. He provides lunch for 5,000 people from just five loaves and two fish. He forgives people's sins. 
His teaching is so authoritative that it fills people with awe. He calls people to follow him and they drop everything and obey. The religious leaders at the time, the ones who should know a thing or two about these things, they're in no doubt. They accuse him of blaspheming because they say he, a mere man, claims to be God. See, Jesus, he leaves people saying only God could say that. Only God could do that. There was a famous Christian writer called C.S. Lewis. He was actually an atheist for a lot of his life, but later acknowledged that Jesus was God and he became a Christian. Have a listen to what he wrote in a book called Mere Christianity. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else, something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And then he closes that section by saying, now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Can you hear what Lewis is saying there? He's saying that if you don't acknowledge Jesus as being God, in very nature God, as this part of the Bible puts it, then you have to wrestle with the evidence and come to your own conclusion. Because if he's not Lord, God, he's either a liar or a lunatic. You don't have any other options available to you. Put another way, he's either mad, bad or God. And so I want you to ask yourself the question this Good Friday, if you don't see him as God... Which is he? Who is Jesus to you? If you don't consider him to be God, are you going to say he's a liar or a lunatic? As extraordinary, as remarkable as that first statement might be, Jesus is in very nature God. Our second key phrase from this part of the Bible is actually even more extraordinary. Very nature servant. Have a listen to what we're told about how Jesus expressed his godness from verse 6 again. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus, who for all eternity past enjoyed all the riches of heaven, as God, owning heaven's glory, having everything in his possession and at his disposal, Yet he didn't consider his position something to be grasped, something to be exploited to his own advantage, for his own benefit. He becomes a human being. He becomes one of us. 
I don't know if the name Peter Norman means anything to you, but he won the silver medal in the 200 metres at the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City. The Australian is probably best known as being the third athlete in the famous Black Power salute photo from the medal ceremony of the same event. In 2005, California's San Jose State University, the university where the other medalists, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, had attended, they decided to make a statue of the famous moment. Peter Norman insisted that there be no statue of himself, but rather that his spot be left empty so that everyone who came could get something of the feeling that he went through, be able to stand in his spot, get a sense of what it must have been like for him at that moment. That's what these verses are telling us about Jesus. And of all the different worldviews and religions in the world, this is where the Christian God is unique, in that he actually stepped into our shoes He feels what it feels like to be living life on this earth. As a human, he stood in our spot. He experienced all the muck and confusion, the sorrow and the anguish of this life, of life here below. Rather than exploiting what was his, rather than it being all about get, get, get for Jesus, it was all about give, give, give. He gave up everything to become nothing. Literally, he emptied himself. Not that he emptied himself out of being God as though he ceased to be God. Rather, he emptied himself into something. What did he empty himself into? Well, the very next phrase explains it for us, doesn't it? He emptied himself, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He who had every right willingly became one with no rights. He who had the highest of ranks became one with no rank. He who had every privilege became one with No privilege. He who was the most significant being in the universe became one with no significance. He who had the highest status became one with no status. It was just over 50 years ago that the Apollo 11 astronauts first landed on the moon. It was an unprecedented human accomplishment, marked, of course, by Neil Armstrong's famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. These verses are telling us that 2,000 years earlier, the creator of the moon made a giant leap of a vastly different kind. He descended from the highest place in heaven to the lowest place on earth. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Very nature God became very nature servant. Yet more extraordinary still is our third and final phrase for this morning, death on a cross. It's what we're celebrating today, isn't it? Good Friday. Have a look with me at verse 8. Verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, here is the humble saviour, Jesus, in obedience to his Father's will, as very nature God and very nature servant, entering into the very depths and extremities of life, death itself. And not just any death, but even death on a cross. 
most people when they're getting to know others or when they're spending time with people that they don't know very well, they tend to avoid certain topics in conversation. We usually steer clear of talking about politics because that can be a bit divisive and a bit controversial. We tend not to talk too specifically about money, like how much our house is worth or how much it cost us to buy that car. There are certain words, topics that we just avoid in polite conversation. Back in Jesus' day, in the first century, crucifixion, death on a cross, it was so shameful that it was avoided in polite conversation. It was just so revolting, so horrific, that you just wouldn't bring it up. It was considered too cruel to be used on a Roman citizen. And for a Jewish person, it was a sign that the person being hung on the cross was under the curse of God. So you've got people like Cicero, the Roman statesman and lawyer and scholar, saying things like this. He describes the cross as being the extreme and ultimate punishment of slaves and the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. You've got people like Josephus, the the Jewish historian, calling it the most pitiable of deaths. That's what this verse is telling us that Jesus went through for us. It's extraordinary, isn't it? When you think of who he is, very nature God, becoming and taking on very nature servant so that he might go to the cross for you and for me. If there was any other way to bring us back into relationship with himself, wouldn't he have chosen that instead? Wouldn't he have avoided going through that? He did that for us. To save, to rescue us, to bring us back into relationship with himself. So, Can I encourage you this Good Friday to consider who Jesus is? Is he Lord or a liar or a lunatic? Is he mad, bad or God? And can you think over why he would have come as a servant? Why he would have humbled himself all the way to death on a cross if there was any other way that you could come into relationship with God It seems like a high price to pay, doesn't it? It seems like an incredibly big step to take. And if Jesus is your God this morning, and that is no small thing to say, is it? (laughs) If Jesus is your God and you know the wonder of his humiliation on your behalf as he dies on the cross as a servant, then this is a behold our God kind of passage, isn't it? See, Jesus, he's shown us God's way, hasn't he? How does that passage begin? Verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Selfless rather than selfish. Others before self. Humble rather than proud. And as we'll see on Sunday, as we come back to finish off these few verses in this section, in Jesus' rising and being exalted, it reassures us that this is the path that God rewards in the end. May you have a truly blessed Easter this year. As you remember Jesus, very nature God, very nature servant, death on a cross. We're going to close our time by singing, Behold Our God. I invite you to stand and, and sing along. Mm-hmm.